little boy about to get out of high school. <laughs> Book of Luke chapter 2 and Deuteronomy chapter 6, Luke 2 and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of your Old Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, third book of your New Testament. I'm going to be a little bit lecturish tonight. I hope you'll forgive me. So if you want to take your shoes off, and put your earplugs in, and start out sleeping now, then it'll make me feel better that you, I didn't put you to sleep. You did it before I got started. Years ago, I was a little concerned about the guy who sit in the very back row, put his head up against the wall like this and close his eyes during the singing. I thought, well, at least I'm not taking the blame for that one. Uh, that is simply, uh, <laughs> anyway, it's a bad thing. But about three years or so years ago, he started having a teenager. We'll see how that example of a father worked for him. You know, when you say amen and chase down every ball team in the county, but church is a bore, you're going to influence your children. No, there's no way around that. Kids are, kids are human beings, and they can call the, the plan, make the plans and call the shots in much of their own life. But we can do an awful lot of, of in creating an environment for them that's helpful. And uh, so we ought to do that. Tonight, though, this is Christian Education Month tonight, probably the most teaching type of a night in regards to where we are in America. First, look at Luke 2, verse 52. <clears throat> Luke 2, 52. I apologize for my voice. I spent a week at teen camp, which is not a problem. It's just that I was breathing the same air in that they were breathing out. <clears throat> and a bunch of diseased teenagers. Uh, we need to have a rule that if your children are contagious, infectious, have typhoid, plague, or whatever, that you can't bring them to camp, or we put them in a quarantine cabin. <clears throat> anyway, Luke 2, the story, of course, in Luke chapter 2, when Jesus stayed back in the temple, uh, when the family came to worship, they left, they realized three days later he'd been gone, and that wasn't that long, it was three days before they found him. And the last verse in chapter 2 is what I want to look at. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now, there's, that's about as, there's many ways you can define education or the desire of a parent for a child. That's pretty reasonable right there. What do I want of my children? I'd like them to increase in wisdom. That's the ability to see the end result of a given action. Uh, the other night, oh, it's been a couple of months now, um, we were at our house with the Josh and Carly's kids, and Josh and Carly were out somewhere, and, and um, I can't remember exactly, oh, I know what it was, we were at the little playground there by our house, and the kids had taken their shoes off and were running around, and, and I was over here with a couple of them, and, and I think Bryce is over here, and uh, not too far away, and he'd picked up a shoe, and, I, and I'm looking at the picture like this, and I see him picking the shoe up like this, ready to launch a uh, ICBM or whatever you want to call whatever, uh, some kind of an assault uh, weapon being fired at a sibling. And he stopped. And then he put his shoe down. That's wisdom. <laughs> now, I'm not saying he shouldn't have thrown the shoe, but he did start to act. He thought about it, and he changed his course of action. We all get tempted. We all, and many of us, get started down a wrong path. The further down the path you go, the harder it is to turn, but you can always change your path. That's wisdom. And we should be teaching our children to look ahead, to think about what will happen if, and by the way, as parents, it's our job. The next word, stature. Uh, stature is physical. As a man, as a human being, as a male Jesus increased in his physical stature and we should be concerned about the physical development of our children and and uh, I'm just gonna be a little blunt tonight and uh, if this is getting recorded we should send it worldwide at least around Wildemar at least around the corner of Walnut and Mission Trail I don't know if you ought to be pulling your kids out of PE Unless they're in such good athletic shape that they need math more. Um, you know, just, I'm just calling them like I see them, okay? Um, we are, uh, we're an out-of-shape culture. 
And there's simply nothing wrong with being toned up a little bit, okay? Uh, the lady PE teacher is not your enemy. <clears throat> well, I feel very alone up here right now. <laughs> Hey, Paul said bodily exercise profiteth little, but it does profit a little. Yeah. All right, it does. It just does. You know, you get three, four babies down the road, 20, 30 years down the road, and things aren't quite in as good a shape as they were before. That's normal. But look, look after your children. Life will be better for them. Life will be easier for them. Increase in stature. A boy that cannot swing a 32-ounce hammer without getting a blister or whining how tired he is, he needs to increase in stature. Boy who can't dig a ditch with a shovel. You know, when you say, get the hoe, and he says, I don't know what that is. Hey, guys, hey, stop. You're done right there. That whole row, you're done, okay? Even if you're laughing at me, no one else knows you're laughing at me. So keep your eyes up here and you're better off. Um, um, young people, I, I, think, I think a girl needs to learn to cook, but I don't think it would hurt at all if she knew how to play tennis or ride a bike or swim or go to the beach and play volleyball with her family or her friends. Look, that's life. That's the world we're in. Um, I don't think it'd be wrong if a girl wanted to go out backpacking and, you know, she could carry the tent and the sleeping bags while the husband carries the rifle. <laughs> just, I got no problem with that. <laughs> stature. Jesus increased in stature. He was a physical man. And can you imagine first century carpentry? No power tools. He was a man's man. And when we talk about what is the purpose of educating our children? What's the goal as a parent? What do I want of my kids? That's one of the reasons I think we should have sports. I think it's good for kids to be physical. I think it's a good thing. And it's good for kids to be hit. Uh, you know, we had boxing up at camp. And, and I think next year I'm going to bring headgear so I worry less. Because as I get older, I sissy out. And I start worrying about things. But I don't worry about the kids. I worry about the parents. And they're not even there. But... Um, but um, it's, it's okay that a boy not be afraid to defend his family. And that's the country that we're in. Um, just ask any law enforcement officer, how long does it take for a policeman to show up when you call 911? Ask him. And then find out how long it takes the burglar to find you. And then maybe you might want to find an alternative. <coughs> You know, whatever alternative you feel comfortable with. Uh, you know, underwater spear gun, a bow and arrow, an assault rifle, bowling balls. <laughs> you know, stand at the top of the stairs and roll bowling balls down. You know, whatever defensive method <coughs> you want. Uh, anyway, I got stories running through my head. The girl who was sure someone was at her house and called our house and said, I'm in the closet with the gun. How do you load this thing? <laughs> I'm thinking, not a good time to learn to load the gun. <laughs> but um, stature, wisdom, wisdom, the ability to see the end result of a given action, stature, that physical development of the human being. We ought to be able to work an eight-hour day and not cry. Amen. Any one of our young men ought to be able to go out on a job site and work all day hard and sweat himself to pieces and come home and drop just dead and feel like he did a good thing that day. And uh, we're, we're a mess. We're just a mess in uh, the, the, uh, the soft culture we're raising. So four things. He increased in wisdom. He increased. Now, we're talking about Jesus, right? We all understand that. This is Jesus. This is the perfect son of God who still increased in wisdom, increased in his stature, and in, he increased in favor with God and with men. Now, you can't develop or rear the right kind of young man or young lady if they aren't growing in favor with God. I would like to think that at 58... I am more wise or more prudent or more capable of pleasing God than I was at 28. I would, I would hope that the last 30 years I've learned some things, 
to make me more pleasing to God. Um, everybody's got to decide what that is. For me, it ought to be a love for right and a disdain for evil. I don't, I don't think I can be in favor with God while I favor wrong. I don't think I can be in favor with God without loving right and loving holiness. Don't get a preacher that's soft on sin when I'm gone. You get a guy who doesn't like sin and who fusses about it. You know, years ago, Brother Howells told the story of an old country preacher got saved later and late in life, and he was a little rough, and he got preaching on the cross and, and uh, preaching on how Jesus had the nails in his hands and feet and how bad the devil was, and he just started cussing the devil. Just now that out a string of about a dozen cuss words. And then realized what he was doing, closed his Bible and walked out. And the church sat very quiet. Finally, the chairman of the deacon board walked up and said, we all know our pastor had a rough past, but I thank God we've got a preacher that cusses the devil. Let's call him back and give him a raise. <laughs> you know, uh, we could, I'd rather you cuss him than invite him to preach at your Easter sunrise service. And so favor with God. And what we do with our children Monday through Friday and Saturday and Sunday ought to be bringing our children up so they are more and more in favor with God. On the other hand, we ought to be training our young people to be in favor with men. It's okay that we learn to negotiate. We learn to get along and we learn proper cultural things. It's okay that we know how to do and how to not, but you can't act that way. People aren't going to listen to you. They're going to think you're an idiot. And uh, yes, you have a right to tattoo yourself from head to toe, smoke six cigars at the same time, and not use deodorant. But you're not going to increase in favor with men. Um, you know, uh, I've told the kids yesterday in class, yesterday in class, every young person should learn to brush their teeth, bathe, use deodorant, and do laundry. Please do not go to college and room with any other human being if you don't know how to do laundry. Um, you know, stink is real. And we got to love everybody. We do love them, but we don't want them as roommates. You know, that's just those simple things. Jesus increased in wisdom, the ability to see the end result of a given action, stature, his physical development, favor with God, his spiritual development, his love for right, his hatred for wrong, and favor with men, his ability to get along, his ability to, know, to, to look at a person and think, what would help? How could I act in a way that would be socially accepted? We don't have to be social rejects to be Christians. You read about David. And David, in his dealings with King's, King Saul's uh, culture, his whole nation, the, the servants under King Saul loved David because he behaved himself wisely. And that's the way we ought to be. And there's something to be said for standing for right. There's also something to be said for standing for right and not having everybody hate you. And that's a very delicate road. Years ago, many years ago, someone, I couldn't even tell you who it is now, we had a wedding here, and someone, as a guest of the wedding, said, I was in college with your son. And I'm not even sure Josh is on our staff yet. And he said, you know what I liked about your son? I said, I don't know. He said, I was the wrong crowd. And he said, Josh never walked with us, but we also knew he liked us. And I thought, I don't know what you just said, but I guess it's a good thing. <laughs> but that blend of, of caring about people, but you don't have to walk the way they walk. Amen. And um, knowing how to deal with people is a very delicate thing. So those are four things. When we think about what is our job as a parent, those are four good targets for us. All right, now let's get more practical. We'll go back to Deuteronomy 6. Let's get some specifics. What can we do to help our young people? Deuteronomy chapter 6. <clears throat> now this is, the book of Deuteronomy is when God was, he gave Moses the directions to re-educate basically and retrain the people of Israel because everybody over 20 years old died in the wilderness. Now these are a bunch of young people who are now, um, they're 40 years wandering in the wilderness, so the oldest are 60 and the youngest are those born in the wilderness. But this group of people, they didn't see, the, they, were, they were children when they crossed the Red Sea, and they were children when they were in Egypt, they're not even born yet. But so this group, it's a new group. And he's going through the law, and he's reminding them of all the things that happened in the wilderness. 
And he says in verse um, 3, Hear therefore, therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that you may increase mightily, as the Lord, thy, Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. So this is the promise. He's saying, here are some things that if you'll pay attention, you can prosper. By the way, that'll work for us. That'll work for our church. That'll work for our nation. That'll work for our state. So verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee shall, this day shall be in thine heart. Now, so verse 5, we're to love God. So if, if you want to bring God's blessing on your home and your family, your church, your state, number one, we need to love God. That's me. That's my direction. I am to love God. And then in verse 6, uh, I'm going to take the word of God. These words which I command you this day shall be where? So I've got to memorize it. I've got to read it and think on the word of God. So number one, I'm supposed to love God, right? Number one, I'm supposed to what? Love God. Number two, I'm supposed to hide God's word in my heart. So number one, love God. Number two, hide God's word in my heart. Simple enough. It's not difficult. We can do that. Verse seven. And thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children. So number one, if we want God's blessing, I am to what? Love God. And then I am to take God's word and hide it in my heart. And then I am to teach the word of God to my children. So I'm to teach my children. How about just teach my children, all right? So number three is to teach my children, not just anything, but teach them the word of God. And then the fourth thing in verse seven, and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So I'm supposed to teach God's word, but I'm also supposed to just talk about it. It should be a part of my daily life. Should be a part of my conversation. Sometimes people say, oh, I'm just worried that they'll, you know, that I'll be a fanatic and I'll be ramming it down their throat. No one thinks that about football. Buy a 70-inch TV and watch seven or eight hours of football a week. No one thinks, no one thinks you're jamming football down your kid's throat. You know, how, Brother Bill, how much money did we spend on football helmets? Any idea what those cost? To buy a new one is about 250 and then every year they have to be reconditioned about 45 50 bucks a piece. So to get a good football helmet, you're going to spend $250 just on their head. Just on their helmet. Not counting the shoulders and all the rest of the stuff and top to bottom gear, uh, taking care of these poor little sissies' bodies. When, real, when men were real men, they just played football bare knuckles. Amen. Back when I played football. <laughs> oh, but, so we spend money on them. We spend money on gymnasiums. We spend money on, on ball fields and lights. And, and we crowd out. You know, the, Other than church, the biggest crowds we have are sporting events. We love sports. And I'm talking about we, this room right here. I'm not talking about we, them out there. I'm talking about we, us in here. And I'm not against sports. We, uh, we have it. I think it's good for our boys. But you know what? You couldn't get too excited about God. You can't get too excited about a big day. You can't get too excited about teaching Sunday school. You can't get too excited about the Bible and reading the Bible and teaching the Bible. If there is a child living in your home, they should hear the Word of God every day. Every day, every day, every day. From the time our children were born, I read the Bible to them. And it was a set time. Uh, weekdays different than weekends just because of our schedule. You do whatever's good for you. But I read to them. But then we talked about it. We'd sing the Bible. We'd tell Bible stories. We'd be out and we'd see the stars and say, look at all those stars God made there. Those stars are so big and so amazing. That's just an incredible God we've got. Thou shalt talk of them when thou rise up, when, they lie, when you lie down, when you walk by the way. So, number one, if we want God's blessing and prosperity, we want to do what? Love God. Love God. Then we want to hide God's word in our heart. And then number three, we want to teach our children the word of God. That's our, and by the way, this is all directed toward men. I'm not against ladies doing it. But men, this is your job as much as anybody else's. In fact, probably it's your job that you share with your wife, not her job and, and the pastor's job and the Christian school teacher's job that you kind of trickle in on. Daddy, you're the one accountable for your home. And it's your job 
to teach your children. And we play, we go to the mountains, we go to the beach, we ride bikes, we throw a ball, we do all that stuff. But I'll tell you what, we talk about the Word of God a lot, and that's how it should be. And then verse 8, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Now all that basically saying, make sure the word of God's all over. Put it on the walls, put it on the coffee table, put it on the refrigerator. The, the word of God ought to be around you written, carved, whatever you want to do. And each culture has different decorator things. And of course, you have to get your wife's permission before you put anything on the wall. But uh, if you want to get a can of spray paint and paint Jesus uh, died for you on the wall of the living room, that's very appropriate if you are not married. <laughs> now, those two things we looked at, what do we want in our children? That they would increase in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and in favor with all right those four things now what can we do to accomplish that well we can go back to Deuteronomy and we can take the word of God and we can determine number one these kids are going to grow up in a home where daddy and mommy love God now if you're one and your spouse doesn't have a heart for God or is not saved then you just do the best you can and keep peace there's directions in the Bible and God will see you through it I'm not saying it's the easiest but you can do it um, you do the best you can so I'm to love God then I personally am to hide God's word in my heart and third I'm to teach God's word to my children and then fourth I'm just will talk about it all the time and then put it on the walls and put it in the dash of the car and type it up on a little piece of paper and tape it to the window where your kids brush their teeth or in the mirror but put the word of God where we see it and see it and see it and see it now with all that being said how can we take a kid and put them in a school 20 30 40 hours a week where none of their friends are Christians and none of the teachers are Christians and none of the books are Christians and they don't really basically God's word is out outlawed pretty hard to do that I don't believe you can fulfill these things we've just now read and not put your children under godly teachers. We can go to Psalms 1 and to not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. We go to Proverbs 13, 20. He that walketh with wise men will be wise. A companion of fools will be destroyed. Who's a fool? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Would I want my children walking and being in close relationships with people who don't believe in God? Absolutely not. They're going to influence my children's thinking. Um, morals. What are the morals being taught by the casual conversation at school? What are the family values? Let me just go and, and uh, take a couple of minutes on uh, something a little bit more intellectual, if you want to call it that. Most of you could probably from heart quote the preamble to the Constitution, if you could only remember what that is. <clears throat> Let me read it for you. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, we do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. And then the Constitution follows. Now, this is from a very commonly used public school text. They just took the beginning of the preamble. This is exactly out of their, um, their work. It's called Building Fluency Through Practice and Performance, if you want to Google it and find it on your own. And they say this, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote general welfare. That means, are you ready? This is what that means. And this is what our public schools are teaching. That means number one, it is the government's job to provide for the basic needs of the people. Number two, the needs of housing and education, transportation and health care are overseen by the government. And number three, Labor laws, the government should make labor laws to ensure that the people work in a safe environment and that they are paid fairly for the work they do. 
That's what our government educational institutions are saying the preamble of the Constitution guarantees. Now let me read the preamble again. We the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. And they said that means the government owes me my basic needs. The government owes me housing, education, and transportation, and health care. And thirdly, the government owes me a job that pays me well. That's not what the preamble's about. So in case anybody thinks that does sound reasonable, let me take you back to 1850. And that's not far, far enough back, but here is a reasonably good document. We believe the Bible, as well as America's Constitution, give parents, not the government, the primary duty and responsibility to direct the upbringing and education of their own children. He goes on, and these things now taken in and out today, meaning honestly today, 2016, the government has become the dominant force in educating children in America. Prior to 1850, the government had little input in the education of America's children. Instead, there was a decentralized system of privately funding and funded and operated schools throughout the country, most of them organized and run by churches and philanthrop philanthropic, that's a, not the right way to say that, but you know what I mean, uh, societies or local community groups. Prior to 1850, schools were run by communities, by churches, or by generous giving of people who wanted to start a school in their community. For the first 150 years of America, and for the first 50 to 75 years of our nation's existence, government schooling was not practiced like it was today. America's founders adopted the Declaration of Independence, and they recognized that under the law of nature and nature's God, uh, the natural laws and the Bible, that parents have the right and duty to direct the education and upbringing of their children. The founders were very well educated. They believed that to remain free, America must always be well educated. They did not, however, believe an educated citizenry required the government to provide, regulate, or operate schools. When America was founded, our founders uh, were very educated, and the government-ran schools did not exist. Our mess in education came when the government took over. Yeah. Right. Has our, has our health care system improved since the government took over? No. no. And neither has our educational system. Right. Neither has anything else. When the government gets its hands on it, they mess it up. Right. Simple as that. It was not a centrally organized army that beat Great Britain. That's right. yep. There were some good leaders, but it was just a bunch of folks. It was this preacher and the men from his church and this uh, mayor and the men from his town. Government messes everything up. I'm not against government, but I just don't want to mess it with too much. The schools, church schools and, acad and academies educated children at all levels, elementary, secondary, and college. Some of these schools provided free education for poor children whose families could not afford tuition or to attend other private schools. These schools were intended to inculcate religious doctrine and principles to the children as well as general knowledge and later education for various businesses or trades. James Kent, in a book on, the, on American law published in 1826 said, the duties, this is 1826, um, a very famous book on Amer commentaries on American law, he said the duties of parents to their children as being their natural guardians consists in maintaining and educating them during the seasons of infancy and youth and in making reasonable provision for their future usefulness and happiness in life by a situation suited for their habits and a competent provision for the exigency of the situation. In other words, your kids need to be taught to work and to be a benefit to society. That's my job as a dad. It's my job to educate them so they can get out of this world and be a benefit, not a liability. Yep. Schools were originally established in early America to enable the ordinary citizen to read their Bible. That was the first and primary purpose of our schools. 
for themselves and then to understand rational order of the universe created by God. The first compulsory school legislation in America was enacted in Massachusetts. How come we're not surprised by that? In 1647, two decades after the first settlers arrived at Plymouth Rock, it was called the Old Deluder Satan Act. It was enacted that all children of the colonies could learn to read the Bible for themselves and would no longer be deluded as they had by previously, previously been through the ignorance on the European continent. The law authorized elected community leaders to, challenge, to charge parents with the responsibility of teaching their children. When there were more than 50 children in the community, the parents were directed to establish a school. Teachers then became the agents, listen to this, teachers became the agents of the parents not the government. Our founding fathers also recognized the need for an educated citizenry. Uh, in, if freedom was to be preserved two months prior to the United States Constitution being adopted, Congress passed a Northwest Ordinance of 18, 1787 to govern the newly settled territories west of the Appalachian Mountains, and the act uh, stated religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to the good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. But the ordinance did not presume the government would do these things. And on and on, there's all this writing. 19, 1859, James Buchanan, president, vetoed the first proposed legislation to bring the federal government into the arena of education. James Buchanan in 1859 said the government's got no business being in education. He said it will not be uh, pretended that any such power is to be found among the specific powers granted to Congress in the Constitution. Our presidents in the 1850s knew the government did not have the constitutional authority to establish schools. Amen. Our government has no right to set up schools. See, the government is supposed to only have the authority that the Constitution gives it. But as George Washington and others or our founders said, the, the power of a, of a government gets bigger and bigger and it's like a cancer that spreads and grows and grabs and pretty soon they're telling you how big a Coke you can have in New York. And they're telling you all kinds of stupid things. The first movement towards a state-controlled education was in 1817. Most of you have heard the name Horace Mann, and he was influenced by Russia or Prussia. Uh, the, uh, he was a Puritan who rejected his biblical faith, became a Unitarian, and he pushed a whole new philosophy of, of education, and he pushed for state control. Here's three things he said. State collection of educational data, state adoption of textbooks, and state control of teachers. That's what Horace Mann wanted. And by the way, that's what they still want. And in our schools in, in America, our schools in California are all under this overwatch. And the more they can infringe on our schools, because, you see, if the, if the government can control the schools, the government controls the mind of your children. Yes. And government is not pro-God. <laughs> government is a force. It's a force like uh, fire that should be controlled, should be feared, it should be regulated. Amen. It should not be government regulating us, it should be we regulating government. Amen. And that's what our founders, and for the first hundred years of our country, they fully intended. The agenda of education in America today is not simply the three R's, it's a sat satanic reprogramming of the minds of young people who should be carrying the gospel to the world but instead are fighting for their rights. In fact, they're fighting parents, and they're fighting government, and they're fighting tradition. Young people in America are being trained, I mean trained on purpose, intentionally trained in our public school system. They're being trained to dislike America. That's right. They're being trained to dislike liberty. They're being trained to dislike free enterprise. They're being trained uh, to dislike the Bible. They're, the young people in America are being trained to dislike traditional family values. Discipline is just, I mean discipline in a family is I would say discipline a child. It's almost capital punishment in America today. That came through our schools. We have let godless professors train teachers 
to, to train our children to grow up and believe biblical discipline is a crime. But we've given our minds to these godless people. Uh, our, our school system has attacked um, a work ethic. They've attacked education and made it, they've, they've attacked education, made it where education, the accumulation of knowledge is more important than the accumulation of character. It doesn't matter how much knowledge you jam in your head. If you don't have enough character to do what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, there's no value. Now, if your character rises with the amount of information, then fine. Our public school system is, is exalting, uh, is, is diminishing ruling oneself and overrating ruling others. That's what we've got. Gover we've got uh, governors and senators and congressmen who love to rule people, yet they're totally out of control. Moral problems, financial problems. If you've ever read the financial um, wrongdoings in Washington, D.C., it's, it's amazing. There's a restaurant right near the Capitol building where a lot of the, the officials in Washington eat, and they can charge their meals. And I saw a printout one time of the money our senators and congressmen owe that they have not paid just for meals. Tens of thousands of dollars. They just don't feel like they owe anybody because I'm a senator. You know, I, I'm in the legislature. And they are, they have, the idea that ruling people is more important than ruling oneself is absolutely, it's dominant in our educational system. Our schools have redefined love as a utopian fairy tale, unavailable and unattainable to men today. But they've exalted physical intimacy as its replacement. Booze is, the most, is touted as the most acceptable recourse for a bad day. Expensive entertainment centers are the dream in a home instead of good marriages and good children. You know, when we focus more time on the size of our TV and the quality of our speakers than we do the quality of our marriage and the size of our family, That's right. we got problems. Yeah. Amen. And, and, and again, it's none of my business what you do in your house. But we've got, we've got way, way too many people over here thinking, I, I would have more children except they're going to be an inconvenience to my life. Hey. Something wrong with that. Now, I personally think I don't want more children than I can feed, clothe, and train. You know, <laughs> the last thing I need is 10 kids and six of them being in prison. <clears throat> but I'm not against 10 kids. I'm just against having more than I know how to train. But what are we thinking? It's not, it's not about, it's about this head here. It's about girls being brought up who'd rather have a career and, and uh, her own life and her own activities than going over here all day long taking care of children and feeding and laundry and clothing. And man, I, I, yeah, that's what a mother is. Amen. On Mother's Day, we don't celebrate mother's career. <clears throat> we messed up America. But see, our schools are destroying our children's view, not our children, our adults. 40 and under have had their view of the family completely destroyed by our public education system. Now, in the schools, there's wonderful teachers, and in the schools, there's great administrators scattered here and there, but there's not a lot of them. Our educational system has made it where watching sports and fights are considered family time. But dad and mom teaching kids about the things that are vital for life is only something you see in an old black and white sitcom. When our kids only learn about family values from Leave it to Beaver or Fred McMurray and my three sons, we've got serious problems in America. When women heroes are carrying 50 caliber machine guns hanging out the back of a Jeep shooting people, we got problems. Our educational system has made it so a person who talks well is honored, but the person who does well is ignored. Right. We have really lifted up big mouths. Right. If, if, you can, if you can talk louder and stronger than the next guy, you're probably going to win even though you're a total idiot. Our schools have, 
taught that if you work hard and succeed, you're bad. But if you don't have a job, you're good and others should provide for you. That's a school product. Understand, our schools are teaching people that. They say, so you know what our Christian school teaches? If you don't work, you go hungry. Now, I think we ought to care for one another. I think we ought to care for the stranger who's poor. But it's not the government's job. The government does not owe me a living. <clears throat> if the government would get completely out of caring for needy people, you know where they'd turn? God. See, people come to our church often and ask for help. And I say, tell you what, I can't help you right now. Could you, could you come by church Wednesday night or Sunday? If you'll come by a church service... I guarantee you we'll find somebody to get some groceries for you. You know how often they don't come? Yeah. Most of the time. Because they'd rather go somewhere where they can get free food and not have to put God in there. Right. And we've got to, we're, we're a mess. We're a mess. Our young people for a generation now have been taught, see, if you work hard and by God's grace you become successful and you make a lot of money and you become very successful, you're the villain and you owe money to those people who didn't get successful. That's crazy. Our current school philosophies promote strong women and effeminate men. They teach men to be soft and peaceful while teaching women and minorities to fight for their rights. We are decades into outlawing, and I'm about to offend somebody, but that's all right. I probably have offended people already, but we're decades into outlawing fighting. And then we panic when a man can't handle the pressure of the military. We take away guns, hunting, and killing of animals, and the sight of blood, and then we wonder why our guys going off to battle need pills when they get out. And I'm not diminishing the pressure on our military. I'm just telling you, real life prepares men for real life. And we've messed our boys up. Schools are protecting little Johnny from anything difficult. Playing only games where all are winners and none are losers. And then we give him a psychiatrist at government expense because he can't handle the difficulties of real life when he can't get a job. That's a school issue. Look, if, if we're going to play, I want to win. Now, I'm, if you're younger than me or littler than me, I'm going to try real hard to not beat you too bad. But I'll still beat you. If I can. Sometimes I get embarrassed. But not very often. Because if you're going to beat me, I'm not going to play. Our schools have taught us to be good losers. And I love the quote from Dr. Jack Isles. Show me a good loser, and I'll show you a loser. Are you for being a bad loser? I'm just not for losing. <laughs> the Bible says it's good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. It's good for boys to work hard. Hard. Now, I'm not talking about that 16-year-old. I'm talking about the 2- and 3-year-old. Make those little kids start working. When are you going to start making the kids obey? And again, it's totally between you and God. I'm just asking a, you know, a hypothetical question. At what point in life do you think a child should start listening? I think they should start listening the moment they're breathing. And you have to work at it. <laughs> but, you know, Dr. Bill Rice, the Bill Rice Ranch, used to say, you should discipline boys sooner than girls. Girls, you should wait at least six months. <laughs> Boys, you should discipline immediately. But anyway, I have no idea what he means by discipline. I'm thinking that's cutting their jello portions in half or something. Okay, I can't go on with that, but it's good to bear the yoke in the youth. It's good for a young person to work, to work hard, to do hard things. And no offense, but some of you moms, you protect your kids. You don't, you don't want them to do anything hard, and then you expect them to be a husband someday. You want to know why we've got a 50% divorce rate? Because we've never made our boys do anything hard. And living with a woman is hard. There, I said it. <laughs> and living with a man is just as hard. 
How about Paul, be strong, or, or Joshua, be strong and of good courage. Or when, uh, when uh, David's men went to battle, they looked at one another and said, show thyself a man. What did he mean by that? What a sexist comment. I love Luke 22, 36. Jesus said to the disciples, he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. I like that. Amen. Now the word sword in the Greek means a 40 caliber Beretta or Colt or Glock. Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. He said, earnest, the Jude said, earnestly contend for the faith. But we have schools and colleges that exalt fame and position more than accomplishments and character. You know, right now with our young people going off to college, I'm focused on Bible college. If they're going to local colleges, I leave it. Parents can pretty much sort that out. But I'm really concerned about the, the end product from our Bible colleges. Does a kid have any dare? Does he have any grit? Does he have any tenacity? Is he willing to live by faith? Is he, does he exalt right more than, he, than comfort? What are, we, what are we producing? What's the end product of these? Does anybody want to go pastor churches? Where are we going to get pastors 10 years from now? When I go to Bible colleges and talk to young people and say, what do you want to do when you get out of college? And none of them mention being pastors, we're in trouble. You better think about starting a church. No, that would be, that would be scary. I, I want we had medical benefits and health benefits and, and a paycheck and a house. And if you kind of wonder why I gravitate toward one college or another, I'm looking for young people that are, that are a product that we want. We're in a country where we've got college degrees in constitutional law, but they hate the Constitution. Yep. Wow, amen. Students who take, this is the worst, students who graduate from medical school and take the Hippocratic Oath that promise to preserve and protect life and then murder babies. Amen. How in the world? Do you know in the, uh, I want to say Greek, it might be Latin, but the old, old Hippocratic Oath, they made a vow and they actually mentioned abortion. That they never, ever could terminate a pregnancy. That was hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of years old. We're, at, we're a mess. And somehow we think it's great that we got this degree for our child. Doesn't matter at all what the degree is, matter what the kid got right in here. This is what you want. If we get this right, then the kid will learn what they need to learn. And they'll get where they need to go and they'll do what they need to do. But as the people of God, we have a responsibility that our children increase in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. We have a responsibility to love God, to hide his word in our heart, and then to teach it to our children all the time, to write it in the doors and the walls and, and make God's word a huge part of our life. That is our biblical obligation. Let's pray. Father, help us tonight to take seriously this matter of training our children and the responsibility of influencing the young people who come to our church from the public schools and young people that we meet around the community. Lord, we pray for your help that we could uh, introduce people to the Bible and to Christianity that's real, that's rich, that affects the way we live every hour of every day. We pray for our young people that they would be lovers of our God and lovers of our faith. We ask for help, Lord. Give wisdom to these parents. Every day they face decisions. Give them grace. Give wisdom. And may we do our best to be what we should be at home, at church, and at school. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you. Have a great night.